Good morning, everybody. I know uh, it's, oh, it's nine o'clock. It feels like we've been in here all morning already, so um, I'm going to do my best to, to, to keep you awake. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. It is the first time that I've spoken personally at the GRSB, but of course McDonald's has been ever present. Um, and I was actually involved right from the early days. I, uh, I remember going to a kind of pre-meeting that we had at the WWF offices in Washington, D.C. I think that was back in 2011, where we just had a group of people saying, you know, should we try and get together some kind of multi-stakeholder group? And, you know, it's just amazing from there to, to look out here and see how that's grown. And um, the work of the Global Roundtable and the Regional Roundtables is, is fantastic. I thought I'd, um, as I was preparing for what I was going to do today, I actually looked back at how some of my, the previous McDonald's people had spoken at, um, at, at this meeting. And um, I look back to 2014 when um, the GRSB meeting was held in Brazil. So the first annual GRSB meeting was held in Brazil. And um, this is uh, Francesca. She was speaking. So I had a look back at what she was speaking about and thought, well, let me just have a quick look and see how things have moved since then. And, and things have changed massively. So I thought I would take you through that real quick. And... Um, what's happened in our business, how we uh, look and approach sustainability broadly across our business and then specifically on beef and perhaps some of the opportunities that we have going forward. So our business has grown a little bit. Um, that's what keeps us going. We've got 37,000 McDonald's around the globe in about 120 countries and uh, we have 69 million customers come through our doors every day. So we're feeding around about 1% of the global population every day. That's quite a significant number. And of course, any small changes that we make can then have a big, Im big impact. So we've had lots of changes. We've had a new CEO. We've had um, um, a big restructure in our business. We now have a, more of a global focus on our business, which has been great for our sustainability work. Uh, we've been through a turnaround plan and now we're in a growth plan and our business um, is performing really well. But one thing that hasn't changed is how incredibly important beef is to our business. We've always been and we still are a very proud burger company. We've got five burgers that we sell around the world that each have a value to us of more than a billion dollars. And our flagship product, the Big Mac, um, that's that has sales annually near of five billion dollars. So beef is big business for us. We've also evolved our sustainability plan. And um, I thought I'd just take you through that really quickly. Because one of the opportunities that we had with becoming more globalized was the ability to focus on a few key areas. It was pretty vague, I think, what McDonald's stood for more broadly across our entire business in terms of sustainability. So what we've done is we, um, we focused on fewer things. We looked at things that were important to not just our customers, but also to our business, and areas where we felt that we were uniquely positioned to really drive significant change. And I think it's probably worth just running through some of those really quickly, because it gives you an idea of how we think about sustainability and also shows how important beef is to us. So when we look across our entire business, we, we framed up our new sustainability program. We called it Scale for Good. And the idea behind it, the concept behind it, was to try and change that perception that big corporations are bad to actually, you know, big corporations can be a real um, force for change and can actually do a lot of good. And if we use our scale and our reach, um, then we can really make some transformational changes. These are the five areas that we looked at, and, um, and these are the five areas that we will talk about now in every country that we do business. So that focus and um, enabling each country to talk about the same things, hopefully, will start to... Um, will start to uh, magnify what McDonald's stand for and people get a much clearer, clearer picture of it. 
And I think there's lessons we can learn there when we talk later a little bit about how we're going to engage and communicate on beef sustainability. Just running through those really quickly, so youth opportunity, we have, um, and for each of these areas, we, we, we put out uh, external goals. Um, we have a global goal to reduce barriers to employment for 2 million young people by 2025. We're a big employer of youth. Um, we have about 1.8 million employees globally, and about 64% of them are young people between the ages of 16 and 24. So you can see why it's important that we can prepare people to come, young people to come to work, because we're going to need that workforce. And at the same time, um, there's a big benefit to society by tackling um, this global problem with youth unemployment. Climate change, we were the first a global restaurant company earlier this year to set a science-based target to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions across our entire business. So um, in our restaurants, in our franchisees' restaurants, um, and back up our supply chain. So big, big societal issues that, that we're trying to grapple with. Uh, packaging and recycling, our customers tell us in pretty much every country where we do business that the biggest environmental issue that they see is the packaging and the waste um, that's left over at the end of the meal that they have. So we set two targets there. One is to have all of our packaging from renewable resources, and the other one is to recycle in every single restaurant around the globe. And that's a huge challenge. And again, it shows how we're going to have to reach beyond our own business to do that, because there isn't recycling infrastructure in pretty much most of the markets that, um, that we operate in. So we're going to have to work with... Um, you know, other interested partner, parties with governments, with um, NGOs, um, to try and set up that recycling infrastructure if we're going to meet our 2025 goals. And then um, the final, uh, sorry, the fourth one there is around commitment to families, um, and that's around uh, nutritional commitments for our Happy Meals, support for our children's charities, and an interesting one which is about um, what we call Happy Meal Readers, which is... Um, uh, through our Happy Meal program, we have a, a, a book reader program. And today, our company and our franchisee restaurants have already distributed 370 million books to children to help with childhood um, illiteracy. And now we have 100 markets committed to putting Happy Meal readers through um, the Happy Meal programs. And of course, the one that we're all here to talk about, really, which is beef sustainability. Um, we made some commitments for 2020 and we focused our efforts on our top 10 sourcing markets but of course we're working we source beef from um, many many markets around the globe but to focus our attention and our targets it was on the top 10 beef sourcing markets and I'll talk about those in a minute where we wanted to sell a proportion of our beef from suppliers that are participating in programs aligned with the GRSB principles and criteria so, so, so far we've had two markets that have been able to do that. Um, Brazil, because of the, um, um, the fantastic round table that, uh, that we have in Bra Brazil, at the 2016 Olympics in Brazil, we had sustainable beef on our menu from um, the Brazilian round table um, aligned with the GRSB. And then uh, you probably saw yesterday in Canada we've launched a... Um, Angus Burger, which is certified by the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, and I'm going to touch on that um, in a little bit. And hopefully soon here in Ireland, you heard about the fantastic work on the Origin Green program. Now that we have a European Roundtable, we can make that link into the GRSB, and, um, and then we can have um, Irish beef that's um, aligned with the GRSB principles. That still leaves seven markets, and... Um, you know, we're not just going to hope that those markets um, get to where we want to be. So we, we do have a roadmap, um, which I was going to take you through. There's four key steps that we're trying to support to help get to the achievement of the goal of um, serving the beef that's aligned with the GRSB principles. The first one is really around um, a method to scale and accelerate progress. And that's really actively supporting um, the, and participating in, in roundtables and industry groups around the globe. 
And you probably heard yesterday, um, McDonald's was mentioned in quite a few of the round tables. So we actively participate, um, and especially in the top ten markets where we're, we're sourcing, we see those as priorities for us. We also um, want to help share knowledge and tools, and that means engaging uh, with our farmers and ranchers to learn about the great stuff that they're doing and how can we share those kind of best practices and um, perhaps support pilot schemes that, were, that are related to priority impacts. A great example of that is in the UK where um, our team there worked with more than 200 farmers in the UK and Ireland on something called sustainable beef clubs. And um, essentially that was... Um, getting groups of farmers together, meeting quarterly, going around to um, each other's farms and looking at some of the uh, best practices around um, improving feed efficiency, um, weight gain, fertilizer use, uh, fuel use, and other areas that are related to um, emissions. And the result, they ran these clubs for over six years, and the result was actually an average reduction in carbon emissions of around about 23%. But more exciting, I guess, was um, the accompanying increase, accompanying increase in farm profitability. Um, we also have a program to promote the very best farmers uh, in our supply chain. Um, we call that our flagship farm program. For those of you that were on the Dawn Tour, you'd have visited John Power's farm. And um, he's one of our flagship farmers based here in Ireland. Now, I do have a video of one of the flagship farms that, um, that we have in Spain, which, which kind of shows how we can use um, our ability to communicate, to connect farmers and show best practices. So let me just, um, let me just run that quickly. Hola, soy Alfonso Covaleda, estamos en Santiñáez del Alto, en el norte de Extremadura y soy productor de vacuno para McDonald's. Esta explotación tiene tres pilares fundamentales, ética, economía y medio ambiente. Nuestra explotación está eh, fundamentada en la DESA, es un sistema silvo pastoral eh, de esta zona de España y única en el mundo en donde hay un equilibrio entre lo que es la fauna y la explotación ganadera. No se entiende lo uno sin lo otro. Lo que busco es la sostenibilidad de, de este sistema. Eh, ayudamos a, a la protección de especies en peligro de extinción. Nuestras vacas eh, están sueltas por, por la dehesa durante todo el año. Soy un apasionado de innovar en, en estos sistemas tan tradicionales. Lo que nos diferencia a, a otras de esas es la forma de alimentación. Hacemos, aparte del heno que hacíamos antes, hacemos, hacemos filado, filado tanto de hierba como de cereales, como posteriormente la forma de repartirlo a través del Unifit. Eso supone que antes dependíamos un 70% de comida externa y en este momento estamos en un 30% y intentaremos eh, minimizarlo más todavía. Uno, los animales eh, tienen una dieta mucho más equilibrada y segundo, es, económicamente es mucho más rentable. Los Kerkus eh, son fundamentales dentro del ecosistema de la dehesa. Resguardo de tanto la fauna salvaje como de los, de los animales de la granja. Segundo, porque dan bellota. Es una, es una alimentación fundamental, adicional y mejor que cualquier pienso compuesto que le podamos dar a ellos. Estamos obligados al mantenimiento tanto de los árboles como de su regeneración. Este año plantaremos sobre 2.500 alcornoques y los protegeremos para su desarrollo y reforestación de la dehesa. Adicionalmente, el alcornoque eh, se va produciendo una corteza que cada 10 años se saca y es bastante rentable para la explotación, ya que se puede vender a unos precios bastante interesantes. Me siento muy orgulloso de colaborar con McDonald's 
y identificarme con los valores que ellos buscan en las granjas insignias. Y me gustaría que todas estas innovaciones que estamos realizando en la explotación, que pueda servir para otros eh, eh, ganaderos, That, um, that film was shot a couple of years ago, and I've been to visit Alfonso a couple of times since, and uh, he's done loads more stuff. So we've got to go, we've got to go back there and, and shoot another film. But it's just to show that, that I think that, um, that we can use our, um, our ability to communicate to facilitate farmer-to-farmer -farmer communication. And then the fourth area that, um, that is in our roadmap to try and get to our 2020 beef goals is what we call setting up um, farm partnerships to support the uh, pioneering new practices. And um, a great example of, of that is some work that we're supporting in the US. We're joint funding a project in the US which is led by Arizona State University um, with a bunch of other academic partners that you can see on the screen there to study a grazing technique called um, adaptive multi-paddock grazing. And I, I know a lot of you will know about that. It mimics the, um, the natural grazing patterns of, of wild ruminants and, um, and has the potential to massively improve um, soil productivity and increase carbon storage. Um, there's another great video. I didn't put it here because it, it runs for 12 minutes, but if you haven't seen it, um, it's um, uh, Arizona State University film by Peter Bick. It's called Soil Carbon Cowboys. And um, if you haven't seen it, you should just Google Soil Carbon Cowboys and watch it. It's fantastic. It appears to be really successful. Um, it's regenerating soils. It's improving watersheds. It's increasing um, biodiversity. And um, the ranches that have been studied so far are demonstrating a significant drawdown of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Um, and initial results suggesting that up to an additional three tons of carbon per hectare per year can be stored in the soil compared to conventional grazing and you know, that's huge. More research is being done, um, we'll have the res more results at the end of next year uh, but we're just very excited about um, the opportunities and the many benefits of this regenerative, regenerative grazing system. We also have a goal to preserve forests and I know we touched on that in some of the discussions earlier. And certainly in the regions um, where we source beef that um, are high risk for deforestation of primary forests and high conservation value areas, um, we have programs to, um, to protect forests there. Um, but there's a couple of other projects that I just wanted to touch on really quickly. Um, one is a project that we're engaged with, with a, a group of dairy companies led by uh, Arla here in Europe. Um, it's a project to quantify uh, carbon sequestration at farm level and also to better understand what are the most um, impactful management actions that can increase the amount of carbon that's captured. The issue is that at present the standards for measuring soil carbon are highly variable. Um, with different levels of science underpinning the claims. Um, and I think it's key to agree standards and methods um, and modeling rules so that we can harmonize the process um, and also underpin practice change. Uh, they recently held a, a workshop in the Netherlands and I know uh, Rory attended that on behalf of the GRSB um, and he also uh, posted about it in the, in the GRSB newsletter um, I just think there's a great opportunity here for the beef sector to align the, with the dairy sector. We both want to talk about carbon sequestration, but if we talk about it in different ways or make different claims, then we just give fuel to those climate skeptics. So um, that's one that I think the two industries need to stay close on. The other really interesting one here is the Oxford Martin School. It's um, part of the Oxford University. It's not a new story, but they published a new paper in June this year that suggests that we are massively overestimating the impact of methane gas on global warming. Um, since the early days of the IPCC, a methodology has been used to calculate the impact of emissions based on equivalence to carbon dioxide. And methane is considered quite a potent gas and 
you know, that's um, evident in, um, in, in how we measure it today. However, what it doesn't account for is the fact that methane degrades relatively quickly in the atmosphere. It has a half-life of about 12 years, as opposed to carbon dioxide, which exists for hundreds of years. So it's very hard to make that equivalence, and um, the paper suggests that this has led to a massive um, exaggeration of the impact of, of enteric emissions. Now, I met with Professor Allen earlier this summer. He's the lead author of the paper, just to kind of discuss it and understand a little bit more about it. And um, he was involved with the IPCC in the early days. He's a leading climate scientist. And he said, you know, when they developed um, the greenhouse gas protocol, they knew that this was an anomaly, um, but they had to just get something and, and move on with it. And they had always planned to come back and address it. It's something that never got addressed. It got lost in the mists of time, and um, I think it's something that we need to revisit as an industry. So we're making fantastic progress. Um, I think the whole uh, industry is making great progress. Some of the work that we're hearing about in the, in the roundtables uh, this week is just incredible. Um, and I've never really been more optimistic about um, the potential for beef production to play really a fundamental role in, in a sustainable and thriving food system. But I do continue to get frustrated around some of the stories that we see in the media. And I know you all do, and I know that's been a kind of undercurrent of the discussion uh, this week. I picked out a, a few headlines. I mean, there's stories like, why is beef the new SUV? Um, is beef the most polluting protein? Ten reasons to stop eating red meat. Can vegetarianism save the planet? And triple whopper which I thought was quite funny because they're not having a go at McDonald's this time. It's one of our competitors. Environmental impacts on global meat production. Um, you know, and only this Monday we talked about the IPCC coming out with their new report trying to keep global warming down to one and a half degrees. And they say that to do that, we would, would, would require a radical transformation of unprecedented scale to avoid a climate catastrophe. And then you put the news on and it starts about fossil fuels and then very quickly it moves into agriculture and then beef. And this one here is my absolute favourite. This is from a company called Impossible Foods. You may have heard of them. Um, and this is their, their CEO talking about the, their purpose as a company. Let me quote this. Our purpose as a company is to protect, preserve and restore the essential natural resources that are being rapidly degraded and destroyed by the world's most destructive technology, the use of animals to produce food. Raising animals for food has helped build and nourish our societies, but at a dire cost to the climate, water reserves and biodiversity. We intend to eliminate the need for animals in the food system by creating the world's most delicious, nutritious and affordable meats, fish and dairy foods directly from plants with a tiny fraction of the environmental impact. I would just love to bump into this guy somewhere. <laughs> so, um, but that's the way people are talking about things. So, you know, how do we go about tackling this kind of undercurrent, this rising voice um, that is getting through to the consumer? Well, you know, we have quite a bit of experience in talking to the consumer. We have 69 million of them come through our doors every day and we spend a lot of money on consumer research. And we know that the consumer's not really ready yet for a complicated message around beef sustainability. Um, our research tells us they don't really understand that word sustainability and they certainly don't understand what beef sustainability means. Um, you know, what's important to them is around taste, you know, what's in the food, Origin is important as well. And then there's this bunch of quality messages that all get mixed up. And we were talking about them this morning, you know, grass-fed, organic, whatever, sustainable. Um, so some of the things that we're doing, I mentioned earlier about um, what we're doing in Canada. This is, um, this is the product that we're serving in Canada right now. Very excited. But our research told us there that you know, we were very keen to go out with 
um, the CRSB certified logo that you can see on the box there. Our research told us that by itself it wouldn't really resonate with the consumer. Um, and so you can see we've got some other messages on there. So we've got the 100% Canadian, which is a, a key message um, in Canada. Um, and we've also got the Angus brand up there quite high. And that's one of those ones, I think, that carries that quality message to the consumer. Perhaps they're not quite sure why, but Angus has you know, got that reputation. And then we've got the CRSB certified logo. So um, we'll know much more about how that's going. Uh, in a few weeks' time. I know it's going to go on to TV, and um, yeah, we'll, we'll get a lot more feedback on, on how that's received by the consumers. But in most markets, as I say, we're not that far advanced with, um, with the round table work, um, and we're still having to address some other issues that the consumers have about the beef. And I've just got a very quick ad that was run recently here in the UK that kind of shows you where we're at with telling a beef story with consumers. This is a cow, as drawn by Laura Evans, age nine and a quarter. Apparently, it's the kind of cow McDonald's use. Laura thinks they're full of additives and other bits, as they wouldn't use good beef just to make burgers. Her mum says so. Hi, Beth. And it must be true because Carol told her. This is Ted. Ted is a butcher. He wants to show them what he thinks makes a great burger. The right feed, fresh air and whole cuts of four quarter and flank. And that's it, 100% beef and a pinch of salt and pepper. And that's exactly what goes into a McDonald's burger. So you can see we're still talking about what's in the product and like that step to talk about sustainability to the consumer, it's, it's still a stretch, even in, in markets like the UK where there's you know, quite, um, quite advanced. But we do know that customers are influenced by what they hear and what they read. And in the advert, they use the hairdresser as the kind of gossip. Um, and I do believe that we have a big opportunity to change that. We heard from Nicole in her opening speech, we need to engage, and I agree 100%. We heard from Justin, he was the beef rock star, um, that we have to accept the problem and then deal with it. I think the challenge we've got is that there's so much noise about, out there about beef. Um, you know, where do we focus our attention? So I think it's time to completely change the narrative. I think we have to start not just defending the negatives, but start really just talking about the positive aspects of beef production. And, and, and how we change that narrative to show how beef can and must be a critical part of a sustainable and thriving food production system for this planet. And like the lessons that we learn as we develop our own sustainability program, we need to focus on a line on a few key messages globally and then develop local examples and local e explanations that resonate in those local markets. You know, from my point of view, I think we have to talk about how beef can be a solution to the two biggest challenges probably that we've ever faced as a planet. That's feeding the growing population and climate change. And sure, there's lots more work to be done, um, but we do have a lot of data already. We have a lot of ammunition. And I think if we can align on that and start the, uh, the engagement with a balanced, credible, and positive narrative, we can really change the perception of beef. So thank you very much. Um, I'm really looking forward to the communication sessions um, tomorrow. And um, I think we've got a little bit of time for questions. We do. Thank you so much. Let's give them a round of applause.